Fair warning, I've given myself a challenge for this episode. I'm going to try to teach you a story from American history without any cynicism. I've kind of realized that my U.S. history class has become a who's who of land stealers, exploiters, and politicians, and while I'm confident that I'm teaching our history the right way, it can get kind of depressing sometimes. So today, I'm going to attempt to tackle the story of Thanksgiving with the bright-eyed, sing-song approach of Schoolhouse Rock. And whenever I can feel myself going down that dark, cynical path, you'll hear this cheerful siren (coughs) to help lift me out of my postmodern revisionist negativity and back to the spirit of the holidays. Wish me luck. 397 years ago, in November of 1621, Governor William Bradford organized a celebratory feast to mark the first successful corn harvest of the Plymouth Bay Colony. Well, I mean, the first successful corn harvest that white people had attempted. Like, Native Americans were like, uh, congratulations, I guess? We've been harvesting maize for years, but whatever. (coughs) The pilgrims invited local Native Americans who had helped teach them how to cultivate the land, an act that spared them the fate of some of the early Jamestown settlers who were so desperate for food that they dug up the bodies of the people who had already starved to death and ate them. Oh man, this is going to be harder than I thought. Today, I want to talk about Thanksgiving. What happened at the first Thanksgiving? Who were these Native Americans who helped the pilgrims? And why is Thanksgiving a national holiday today? Spoiler, it has to do with war, secret arms deals, and the lady who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. This is Anti-Social Studies. I'm Emily Glankler. Settle in and let's get some historical context. Act 1. The Story of Thanksgiving. In September 1620, a small ship called the Mayflower left Plymouth, England, carrying 102 passengers. These passengers were an assortment of groups who were leaving England seeking religious freedom. Remember, Henry VIII had split from the Catholic Church just 86 years earlier, and there were some Protestants who believed that his new Church of England hadn't gone far enough in eliminating the sinful practices of the Catholic Church. I mean, it's kind of fair when you consider that Henry VIII had six wives and executed two of them, but whatever. The more radical of these groups wanted to purify the Church of England. These are Puritans. And an even smaller group of those wanted to separate from the Church entirely. They're called Separatists. Basically, the Mayflower was filled with some of the most radical religious Separatists who had become so frustrating to the English monarchy that they decided to just put an ocean in between them. Like, get out of here. Oh my gosh. The journey lasted over two months, and although they intended to land near the mouth of the Hudson River, they missed and ended up in Cape Cod. I guess you could say they... Pulled a Columbus, am I right? (laughs) Eventually, they ended up in Massachusetts Bay, where they established the village of Plymouth. The first winter was so brutal that most of the pilgrims lived on the ship. They made it through to the spring, at which point they moved onto the land permanently and were visited by a Native American who greeted them in English. Now, sometimes we think of the people in the Mayflower as the first English colonists, but that's not true. The British had been attempting to found colonies since the 1580s, 40 years before the pilgrims bumped into a rock and called it Plymouth Rock. Their first permanent successful settlement was in 1607 in Jamestown, Virginia, 13 years before the Mayflower. And this is important for two reasons. Like we talked about a few episodes ago, disease had already spread rapidly along the East Coast, so when the pilgrims arrived, they were seeing the survivors of that demographic disaster. But that also meant that the natives, at least those along the coast, were already somewhat familiar with these strange white people, and some of them even spoke English. Now, We'll see that that's partly because some of them had already been kidnapped by British explorers, but... I know, I know, I know, but more on that in a few minutes. For now, just know that the pilgrims were put into contact with a native man who spoke English and was the last surviving member of his tribe. He taught the pilgrims how to cultivate corn, extract sap from maple trees, catch fish in the rivers, and avoid poisonous plants. He also served as a translator and mediator between the early Plymouth colony and the local tribes, helping them forge an alliance with the Wampanoag tribe. So the first official Thanksgiving was in November of 1621, one year after the Pilgrim's voyage to the New World. William Bradford, the governor of the new colony, organized a three-day celebration as a symbol of the new alliance between his people and the Wampanoag. On the menu was a ton of food native to the New World, including, of course, wild turkeys. The alliance between the Plymouth settlers and the Wampanoag Indians would last for over 50 years, and it's sadly one of the few examples of whites and natives working together, a brief vision of what could have been. 
It's a huge achievement, both the alliance and the fact that the pilgrims didn't starve, and almost all of the credit goes to an enslaved native who had already traveled to Europe and back before the pilgrims arrived. Act 2. Squanto. Tisquantum, nicknamed Squanto, was born somewhere around 1585. For some historical context, in 1585, Elizabeth I was ruling England, the Spanish had just defeated the mighty Ottoman Empire as they fought for control of the Mediterranean Sea, and in Japan, Tokugawa Ieyasu was assembling a powerful military force that would soon unite Japan and slowly bring it out of its feudal period and onto the world stage. Squanto was born into the Patuxet tribe along Cape Cod Bay. The same year he was born, the English established their first attempted colony on Roanoke Island. And even though that colony would famously disappear, this means that Squanto's life occurred within probably the most fascinating and destructive centuries to be a Native American. And his life mirrored that. It's fascinating and sad and also kind of inspiring. Throughout his childhood, he would have heard rumors about the strange white men living along the coast, Often, native tribes would observe some of the early explorers and colonists for months without making any contact. Unfortunately, they also would have learned very quickly to be fearful of these people, as kidnapping natives had become a common act for many of the early English arrivals. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get this out of the way, because I'm about to do a paragraph on the kidnapping of native people. Yeah, I know, but this is important. Why were these kidnappings so common? We're not sure, but it seems to be one of a few different motives. For one, it was a way to quickly show the natives the power and might of these new white men. Selfishly, it also was just a quick way to learn about the native people they would be encountering, and there were also instances of white people taking natives back across the ocean to use as a twisted sort of advertisement to attract new investors into their ventures in the new world. And these natives would then be sold into slavery in Europe. It's ridiculous to think about now, but a lot of these kidnappers don't seem to have considered this problematic in any way. In fact, we have evidence of some of the Plymouth settlers speaking with families of natives who had long ago been kidnapped, Squanto himself often translated, and white people were shocked to learn that a native mother who had all three sons kidnapped would also feel pain and sadness about her loss. This was the level of racism we're dealing with. Remember that many Europeans saw Native Americans as a strange and fascinating animal, not quite human. So when they spoke with a woman who couldn't look at white people, quote, without breaking forth into great passion, weeping and crying excessively, they were stunned. What's wrong with you, you racist idiots? Ugh, I know. Let's move on. So Squanto himself was kidnapped, we think in 1614, so he would have been around 30 years old. John Smith, you know him, founded Jamestown, saved by Pocahontas, voiced by Mel Gibson. He was on an expedition to explore the coast of Maine and Massachusetts Bay when his second-in-command, Thomas Hunt, took a ship that was meant to be loaded up with cod and then to sail back to Spain. But Hunt decided to load up more than just fish. He lured 20 Patuxet Indians, including Squanto, onto his ship by promising them trade. And when they got on the ship, he locked the doors and set sail. Cool. Thanks, Thomas. It should be said that Mel, I mean, John Smith, vehemently disapproved of this action and basically wrote that Hunt would never work again. Good for you, John Smith. I can see what Pocahontas saw in you. We don't know what happened to Squanto for a few years, but we're pretty sure he wasn't finding himself as he backpacked across Europe. The best guess is that he was sold to the highest bidder and ended up back in England. He would be highly desirable for merchants looking to establish trade in the New World, especially once he picked up English. One way or another, Squanto ended up back on a boat to Newfoundland, where he would work as an interpreter for an English captain for a few years. He was such a highly valued interpreter that he was sent around the northeastern colonies to help the new English arrivals. He eventually ended up close to his birthplace and was allowed to go and search for his family. But he was the only one left. Literally. He went home and found out the disease had wiped out his people while he was enslaved, and he was now the only remaining Patuxet Indian in the New World. Squanto was eventually captured by the Wampanoag Indians who used him to establish interactions with the pilgrims at Plymouth Bay. Yada, 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 now we eat cranberries from a can. Squanto earned himself quite the reputation during his life as he navigated this tricky balancing act between the two worlds. Many other Native Americans viewed him with intense mistrust because he was so close with the white men, and there's some evidence that later in his life, Squanto reveled in the power he had. Here's a passage from a book written by Mayflower pilgrim Edward Winslow about Squanto. Quote, 
His course was to persuade the Indians that he could lead us to peace or war at his pleasure, and he would often threaten the Indians, sending them word in a private manner that we were intended shortly to kill them, that thereby he might get gifts for himself to work their peace. Basically, Squanto would go to the Native Americans and say, hey, y'all know that I'm BFFs with the white people, right? Well, I heard them talking the other day, and they're about to attack you. But I'm pretty good friends with them, and I think that they might listen to me. If y'all would sweeten the deal, maybe give me some stuff, I might go back and try to convince them to not go to war with you. It's kind of brilliant. Now, the way Winslow is writing about Squanto, it's clear that he views this behavior as immoral. But frankly, I think it's badass. Here's a guy who's been captured, enslaved, the last remaining member of his tribe, but he's found a way to gain power and influence with the people who were, indirectly, to blame for his hardship. Not to mention that the Wampanoag tribe captured him and basically traded him to the pilgrims for safety and some European wares. Are you telling me that you wouldn't do whatever you had to do to survive and gain power in that situation? You wouldn't mess with both sides a little, threatening the natives with the white settlers and vice versa? I think it's amazing. Now, he did get himself into some hot water when he started spreading rumors that Massasoit, the Wampanoag chief, was conspiring with other local tribes to attack the colonists. This obviously sparked massive fear and panic amongst the colonists, and when they learned that Squanto had made it up, they were furious. Again, for the record, I think this is fantastic. Who knows why he did it? Maybe he hoped that both sides would go to war, and he might be able to escape and live his life on his own terms again. Or maybe he just wanted to screw with all the different groups who had used him for so long. Either way, I'm for it. Squanto was eventually saved by his BFF and the other half of an amazing cross-cultural white native bromance, Governor William Bradford. We know a lot about Squanto's life from reading Bradford's journals. He was clearly amazed by Squanto and realized how lucky they had been to have him on their side. He referred to Squanto as, quote, a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. Squanto maintained a good relationship with the pilgrims for the rest of his life, The pilgrims invited him to live on their plantation, and they even organized a rescue mission to save his life after he was captured by a nearby tribe. Squanto was eventually selected by Bradford to lead a ship of settlers on a trading expedition around Cape Cod, and it was on that trip that he contracted an unknown disease. Governor Bradford stayed with Squanto for the last days of his life and described his death as a, quote, great loss. See? I told you I was going to make this a nice episode. Not all white dudes from the past were terrible. Act 3, Turkey Day. So, this story's been nice and all, but why is Thanksgiving now a national holiday where we eat turkey, drink too much wine, and fight with each other over settlers of Catan? Or is that just my family? First of all, the pilgrims were not the first to have the idea of a massive feast to show gratitude. Similar festivals have been celebrated all over the world throughout history. Like, in the ancient times, the Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans all feasted and paid tribute to their gods after the fall harvest— Even the Native Americans themselves had a long tradition of commemorating successful harvest seasons with feasts and parties way before white people showed up. And for a long time in American history, Thanksgiving was not an official thing. It was something that occurred sporadically to celebrate major events. The second Thanksgiving was held by the pilgrims two years after the first to celebrate the end of long drought. And throughout colonial American history, various groups and colonies would declare days a special Thanksgiving day, but there was no coordination or regularity. During the American Revolution, the Continental Congress designated a few days of Thanksgiving each year to rally the troops, and in 1789, George issued the first Thanksgiving proclamation made by the U.S. government, calling upon Americans to celebrate their independence and the recent ratification of the Constitution. From then on, every president would designate some day as a general day of Thanksgiving. Well, everyone except Thomas Jefferson, who had this crazy idea called separation of church and state. He refused to celebrate Thanksgiving because he believed it was state-sponsored religion. What a downer, right? Like, just pick up a turkey leg, Thomas. Get over it. So Thanksgiving had been a general holiday that occurred on different days in different states throughout early American history. And it wasn't very popular in the South since it was associated with the Northern colonies. And because apparently back then the North and South literally couldn't agree on anything. Really? It wasn't until a lady by the name of Sarah Josepha Hale came along and insisted that we all get our act together and make Thanksgiving a real thing. Sarah Josepha Hale was a writer, poet, and magazine editor, known for writing the nursery rhyme Mary Had a Little Lamb, among many other things. She was raised by parents who believed in education for girls? What? And she married a lawyer who supported her pursuit of writing? Double what? 
As the editor of the Godey's Ladies Book, she was one of the most influential voices of the 19th century. Her magazine columns gave advice to women on how to raise their children and also advocated for women's education and the abolition of slavery. It should be noted that she was not a fierce women's rights activist. She believed that women should get an education so that they could be better wives and mothers. And she fought against women's suffrage because she feared that politics would distract women from their duties at home. So, you know. But her magazine did give a voice to many activists who were pushing for social change, albeit at a very slow pace. Albeit at a very slow pace. Hale also worked to preserve historic sites, including George Washington's home, thank you, and the site of the Battle of Bunker Hill. So, Sarah was a lady, a writer, a Christian, and a historical enthusiast. To her, Thanksgiving was the epitome of a truly American holiday, and she spent her life lobbying the government to make it official. For 36 years, she published editorials and sent letters to people at all levels of government asking for Thanksgiving to be named a national holiday. This lady really loves turkey. Finally, one president read her letter and took her up on her offer. Good old Abraham Lincoln. And now we've reached the section in our episode that I'm calling Presidents Make Everything About Politics. Like, seriously, presidents can't ever just do something nice without making it about some bill they're trying to pass or some war they're trying to win. It's exhausting. For Lincoln, it was the Civil War. In 1863, the war had been raging for over two years and morale was sinking in the North. There were those who just wanted to let the South secede, like who needs them anyway, if it meant that their sons and husbands could come home. So Lincoln needed something to boost morale, and in walks Sarah Josepha Hale. He issued a proclamation asking all Americans, North and South, to ask God, quote, to commend to his tender care all those who have been, become widows, orphans, mourners, or sufferers in the lamentable strife, and to heal the wounds of the nation. Lincoln scheduled Thanksgiving for the final Thursday in November, and it was celebrated as a national holiday on that day until 1939. You see, FDR, in the midst of the Great Depression, wanted to spur retail sales, and so he moved the holiday up a week because apparently eating a lot of turkey has always made Americans want to go out and buy crap they don't need. People saw right through FDR's attempt to use a national holiday to strengthen his economy, and they jokingly called it Franksgiving. Two years later, FDR signed a bill officially making Thanksgiving the fourth Thursday in November. My final entry into the President's Make Everything About Politics conversation is about Reagan. Remember when we talked about the Iran-Contra scandal? You know, the one when the president ignored the direct advice of Congress and secretly sold American weapons to our enemy Iran and then used that money to secretly fund an anti-leftist guerrilla force fighting against the socialist government in Nicaragua? Pretty standard stuff, really. Anyway, Reagan was under attack from the press when the scandal got out, and there was a lot of suspicion that he would pardon the two key players that orchestrated the Iran-Contra affair, John Poindexter and Oliver North. Side note, I cannot read John Poindexter's name without immediately breaking into Bust a Move by Young MC. A chick walks by, you wish she could sex you, but you're standing on the wall like you was Poindexter. Anyone? Karaoke night? I don't know. Also, the other guy, Oliver North, is now the new head of the NRA. So that's cool. So the press kept asking Reagan whether he was going to pardon his guys. Meanwhile, there was a turkey named Charlie who was like hanging around the White House for some Thanksgiving event or photo op. I don't know. And he was about to be sent to a petting zoo. So when an ABC News reporter asked Reagan whether he would pardon North and Poindexter, the president responded, quote, well, if they'd given me a different answer on Charlie and his future, I would have pardoned him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a silly attempt to misdirect journalists, but it ended up becoming an official ceremony, formalized under President George H.W. Bush, who was the first to have a presidential pardon ceremony for a bird. We live in a strange world, y'all. I would like to break my own rule and be cynical again for just a second. Because Native Americans today have a very different view of our Thanksgiving holiday that's important to acknowledge. Even though the story of the Pilgrims, the Wampanoag, and Squanto is a pretty nice story, especially considering the alternative, it's not representative of the typical relationship between natives and white settlers. I think we all know that by now. Many Native Americans take issue with the way that Thanksgiving and its story are presented to the public, especially to children, because it very literally whitewashes what was a largely violent, destructive, and painful experience with kids dressing up with buckle hats and Native American headdresses. 
Since 1970, some protesters have gathered on the top of Coles Hill overlooking Plymouth Rock on Thanksgiving Day to commemorate a national day of mourning for the millions of Native Americans who weren't given the Squanto treatment by the white settlers. In the minds of a lot of people of indigenous descent, Thanksgiving is only second to Columbus Day on the list of offensive holidays the U.S. government has chosen to celebrate. But for now, just this once, let's focus on the positives. This is a rare story in American history that actually went the way we all want stories to go. Religious refugees traveled thousands of miles to find a new home. Y'all should know it has taken all of my strength to not call it the Mayflower Caravan this whole time. They arrived and were helped by the natives who, even though they had already experienced massive hardship and pain, were willing to help these new arrivals. Instead of cultures clashing, there was a period of cultural exchange, aided by another man who had every reason to hate everyone involved, but instead chose to act as a mediator for a peaceful outcome. And then they all sat down at a table together to share their gratitude. When you think about it that way, it's pretty nice. Happy Thanksgiving, y'all. 